Okay, so it seems like it's gonna work out a lot better being on my phone. So here I am, and we're just gonna do it this way. Okay, I am closing my computer because goodbye, that did not work at all. Okay, hello everybody, I'm Jessica Sutnick. I am here for an Ask Me Anything Facebook Live. And my, um, my goal is to encourage anyone who's interested even a little bit in a career in eating disorders to pursue it because it's been almost 25 years. Let's see, I took the RD exam in 1998. So I've been a dietitian since 1998. I have been studying the field since maybe closer to 1995 when I first developed an interest in it. And I've never had a boring day at work. There's been hard days, that's for sure. My career has definitely been flexible, taking me to a lot of places, 49 out of the 50 states, and every level of eating disorders care. I've met amazing people. Um, I love my career. It's definitely hard. There's definitely a lot of systemic problems that I have a real problem with. Um, and we can definitely talk about those. So my first question is about, um, is from Sharon Lemons. And she said that, um, she asked about COVID and, um, what has been going on in, oh, I see that you're there. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so, so, so happy. Okay. Um, sorry. I, the tech is just really throwing me off. So she was asking about COVID-19 and eating disorders. There have been a lot of things that have changed because of COVID-19, including the obvious, which is telehealth. Uh, dietitians doing phone and video visits instead of in person. And at first, I think a lot of people were thrown off by that, but it turns out there's a lot of things you can do in a phone or video session that you maybe can't even do in a person-to-person -person session unless you're in someone's home. So for example, asking someone to show you what's on their plate or in their pantry, they can be sessions in live time. So there were some pluses about that. Also, it was challenging to do a nutrition-focused physical exam at first online or um, on video, but there's a lot of things you can do. You could have someone walk back, you know, to the end of the room and come back and see, and you know, how are they feeling? You can also ask someone to do a capillary refill test. Um, there's lots of different ways that we can make um, virtual visits or telehealth visits actually work for us rather than against us. So that I think is a positive because it increases the access for people who maybe don't have a dietitian in their local area or are housebound or unable to get to a dietitian for whatever reason. There's also the downside, which is that so many people were developing new eating problems or relapsing with old eating problems that a lot of dietitians started having waiting lists, a lot of eating disorder treatment facilities had waiting lists, and so there was a real lack of services on a quick basis for people who needed them right away. And so that was really hard because dietitians are helping people and we always want people to get our help. So it was really challenging, I know, when people had to um, say no and turn away clients because they were full and that was really challenging. I talked with a lot of the dietitians I supervise about how to handle that stress of not being able to help everyone. So those that would be the, the plus and the minus of um, COVID. So thank you very much, Sharon, for your question. I'm going to scroll here because I see that there's another question and that is, Christina, what's the best way for an RD to get into eating disorders, meaning best practice before they start taking eating disorder patients. And by the way, Christina, I know I owe you an email because we are going to have an exciting program for Christina's students um, sometime in next year, in March, and they're all gonna do eating disorders boot camp. So don't fret, I will be getting back to you. Um, but the, in answer to your question, the best way for a dietitian to get into eating disorders, so best practice before you start taking eating disorder patients, the very best thing you can do, if at all possible, is work in an eating disorder program or with another dietitian who works with individuals with eating disorders, whether that's a sports dietitian, um, working with them is probably the best because that would be the longest term where you really get to learn. Um, but of course, interning is a good option and uh, ongoing supervision with a dietitian or mentorship with a dietitian who is more experienced is the very best way because you don't wanna be the smartest person basically in the room when you're a new grad or you're new to seeing individuals with eating disorders. That is not to discourage anyone because 
doesn't matter what area of practice you go into, you will be working with individuals with eating disorders. It's just statistics, it's just numbers, right? Not everyone with an eating disorder even identifies it as an eating disorder to go get specialized eating disorder treatment, but even people who have identified eating disorders aren't all getting specialized eating disorder treatment. So whatever area you work in as a dietitian, you will be working with individuals with eating disorders. So it's really important that you um, are in contact with someone that can guide you. And whether that's someone at your facility, whether that's someone in your local area, or whether it's someone long distance who you pay for consultations, uh, the best possible way to learn if you don't, if you aren't in a facility that is specifically working with individuals with eating disorders is to talk through your patient case situations with someone very experienced. So that is actually my job and what I do most of the time is talk with dietitians. Now granted, they're not all new dietitians. Some are very experienced dietitians. And I think one of the things that would be helpful if we learned as dietitians is that it's always helpful to consult with someone else when you are stressing about something because you know it's hard to access sort of your wise mind when you're feeling under pressure. And so I'm I'm honored that some of the dietitians that I consult with have been dietitians for as long as I have. They just need another person to bounce things off of when they're trying to make a tough decision related to, let's say, maybe discharging a client or something like that or an interpersonal, interprofessional issue. So to me, that consultation, so number one, work in a facility where they specialize in eating disorders, work in a facility where there's a specialty eating disorder program or a specialty eating disorder dietitian, work in a practice where there's a specialty eating disorder dietitian, even if you are not specifically um, in a eating disorder hospital. And then um, if you are in private practice on your own or in a facility where you are the only dietitian who has any um, eating disorder clients or expertise, that's when you bring in someone from, um, from outside to guide you. And a lot of times employers will pay for that. I know a lot of the, in the dietitians I, I work with, their facilities pay for my services because they don't have a dietitian available and, uh-oh, cough coming. <clears throat> and the ability for that dietitian to consult with me on a regular basis means that they're doing better patient care, decreasing their risk and liability, and improving and increasing the number of clients that they can serve because they essentially have um, someone with expertise that they can turn to when they need it. Now, granted, I'm not seeing the client, so for you know, in large part, um, I am helping the dietitians help their clients. Um, but a lot of times that's really all they need is some guidance because dietitians were really good at helping people with eating disorders, even by nature, because if you think about what are eating disorders, they're really just dysfunctional eating practices. And so a lot of times we are educating about harmful beliefs about food. A lot of times we're making suggestions about managing and planning, and we're really, really good at that. It's only in the cases when someone is you know, medically at risk or psychiatrically at risk that becomes a situation where it's no longer safe for someone to be seeing a dietitian outside of a, an eating disorder facility or hospital that can treat them correctly. So I think that it, it's really important for everyone to at some point feel comfortable seeing someone with an eating disorder and not saying you have to go see someone else, but there are situations where that's true. And the last thing I'll say is if you have a relationship with someone who has an eating disorder, you're seeing them as a client or patient and you think maybe I shouldn't keep seeing them now that I've realized they have an eating disorder, maybe I should refer them on to someone else. That's a possibility, but talk it over with that someone else first because for me, 98% of the time, I would rather coach that dietitian who already has the good relationship through what's going on with that client rather than having the client have to start fresh with a totally new dietitian. And so in a lot of cases, that background of trust that and rapport that someone has already made with their dietitian, it's just a matter of maybe a little confidence building or some suggestions from someone like me and that client can continue to see that same dietitian. So I hope that's answered your question. That was a long answer to a short question, but a very important one. So let's see, what is the best way, this is Sarah, what is the best way to work with ARFID patients who are non-compliant with suggestions and meal plans. Oh my gosh, Sarah, this is not about you, but I already have a problem with some of the wording in your question. Um, the first one, of course, is ARFID because, you know, it stands for Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, but really ARFID is more of an umbrella and it doesn't actually mean anything, right? It means someone who's not eating enough, but doesn't really have an explanation for why they're doing it that fits in with our traditional narrative of anorexia. 
nervosa, which, you know, is sort of an unhelpful way of defining a diagnosis based on what it's not. So, um, so I'm going to say the best way to work with individuals who are diagnosed with ARFID, I'm going to say that because ARFID itself isn't a condition. And then non-compliant. Okay, so that is to me a very judgmental word, and I'm not calling you judgmental, Sarah, at all. Just the idea that, that you know, because I, I know what you mean by non-compliant. You mean they're not able to follow the plan. Um, and so, but I'm going to sort of scratch the word non-compliant and say not, not able to follow the plan. And what I suggest is reworking the plan, figuring out what are that individual's uh, abilities, maybe getting some uh, caregivers, loved ones, family members, spouse, roommate, coach involved as far as you know, what do you know to be this person's strengths? What are ways that we can support them? Um, and then of course, asking the client themselves, you know, what is getting in the way? To help, help me understand what, um, what exactly, where exactly the problem was. And so this applies to anyone with a diagnosis of anything, I suppose, but specifically, you know, in answer to your question about individuals diagnosed with ARFID, um, where exactly did the plan break down? So in other words, let's just, I'm going to make up in my head that the plan was to try a pancake. I'm just making that up. So the client comes back and has not had a pancake. So the question then would be, okay, tell me exactly where the plan broke down. So were you sitting here in my office last week or online with me last week and thinking there's no way I'm going to eat a pancake, even though your word said, okay, I'll, I'll accept that plan. I'll take that challenge. So was it already a bad idea or, an, a, you know, a fail when we were talking or did you really believe in your heart that you were going to, to do this? Okay, so if already they, the individual says, well, I just knew I wasn't going to do it, but I said yes anyway, then that opens the door to talking about, you know, I'm it sounds like you didn't want to disappoint me. I want to make sure you know that this is a collaboration. And so if I say something that just doesn't sound realistic, just say that to me. Just say it doesn't sound realistic and we'll figure out what to do next. On the other hand, if they say, well, no, I really was planning to do it when we met, then the question is, okay, what happened next? So did you go to the store to get the pancake mix or did you not even go to the store? Or did you go to the store and forget about it because it wasn't on the shopping list? Or did you have your groceries delivered like you do every week and you forgot to have add pancake mix. And if the answer is one of those things, then you know what you would do next. If the answer is no, I went I went to the store. Okay, so you went to the store. Did you buy the pancake mix or what, what went wrong? Did you put it in the cart and then take it out before you got to the cash register? Did you look at the label and say, there's no way I'm going to eat this? Did you realize you didn't have enough money for it? Like what exactly happened when you were at the store? And again, that guides you toward where you're going to have an intervention. And let's say that the person did buy the pancake mix, got it home. Okay, did it just stay in your pantry and you never did make it? Was it because you forgot about it? Was it because you felt overwhelmed? You just didn't want to do it? There was no time? And if any of those are the answer, you figure out what to do to modify the plan to overcome whatever that barrier was. If the answer is, no, I got it and I, I got the mix out and I, I made the pancakes. Okay, so at what point did the plan break down? Did you actually like make a pancake and get it onto the griddle? And at that point you were like, oh, there's no way I'm eating this. Or did you mix up the batter and say, this looks gross, I'm not doing this. Or like at what point did it actually break down? Um, did you actually get the pancake on the plate and you put it in your mouth and you thought, oh no, I'm not swallowing this. Tell me exactly where this broke down. And again, that will tell you where you have the opportunity to intervene. And it may end up being something that involves a speech therapist or a doctor or a um, mental health professional. It, but it depends on where it broke down. It may involve a support person. It may involve um, a food bank, right? There's so many different places where something could break down, where someone has not been able to follow the plan. And as dietitians, we're so full of ideas that we just come up with a new plan. Okay, the pancake thing didn't work. Let's do this other thing. And so instead, we need to really go back and sort of dig deep. I, I think of it kind of like an archaeologist. And, and it sounds really painstaking. And I went through the whole process with you in a very painstaking manner to show that that's really what I would do with an individual is really talk through every single possible place where the the plan broke down not the individual but the plan broke down so that we could figure out how to do it differently and there are possibilities where we might say okay you know what i feel like there's too many challenges in that plan so let's let's not do pancakes 
what's something maybe um, that would be more simple or to say something like, okay, it sounds like making pancakes was really overwhelming. Do you know anyone that would make a pancake for you? Or what about going to IHOP and ordering a pancake? Would you feel comfortable eating at IHOP or would it be better to take a pancake home and eat it at home once you ordered it from IHOP? Those kind of things. And so we're really trying to dig down with our, you know, that little paintbrush that archeologists use to dust off their relics and really trying to find out what exactly is the root of the problem so that we can solve it. And again, it may not be something we can solve. It may end up being something that, you know, someone needs a swallow study or it could be all kinds of different things. But the idea being that we are trying to really figure out where the plan and the person kind of fell apart as opposed to the plan was good and the person just didn't do it. So thank you for your question and thank you for letting me use you as an example. I really appreciate that. Let's see, are there any more questions? Oh, I see friends' names and that's so cool. I'm gonna say hi, friends, because um, I don't wanna just say hi to every single person because that would take the whole time, but let's see. I gotta thank you so much. That's great advice, appreciate it, fabulous. Let's see, do I see any more? Oh, here's one. Is your boot camp appropriate for someone who's still a student? I'm interested in going into this once I graduate. Oh, love, love, love that question. I think Eating Disorders Boot Camp is perfect for a student because it is meant to be the class that you never had on eating disorders. And I will tell you that in 2013, maybe when I stopped doing boot camps the first time live, I thought for sure I would never go back to doing them because it just never occurred to me that the curriculum for dietitians wouldn't catch up. I mean, of course, the curriculum for dietitians is going to include eating disorders, right? But that never happened. So I started doing eating disorders boot camp again live in 2016. So the the now the eating disorders boot camp training package that you can purchase actually has three recorded workshops that I did live and then it includes my books it includes so much stuff. It basically is a semester long course. I mean it ends up being I think 34 hours of CEUs once you do everything. And so as a student, yes, I would say absolutely order it purchase it, watch it, listen to it. Oh, there's also counseling videos. So do the whole course, but the part where you submit for CEUs, okay, because it doesn't have a test, I don't like tests. So because it doesn't have a multiple choice test, instead we do a consultation call and that's where we, um, that's where I can certify your CEUs because we have that interactive portion. So save that part for once you start, for once you pass the RD exam and you have your RD credential, and that way you get the 34 CEUs and your certificate, and that goes toward your 75 CEUs that you need in your first five-year credentialing period. But you can absolutely do all the listening and reading and watching as a student. And I think it would actually look good on your resume if you're applying for a job with anyone that knows anything about eating disorders and you say you were so interested in eating disorders as a student that you took eating disorders boot camp um, by Jessica Setnick, I think that will mean a lot to someone who is um, hiring in the eating disorder field because they know that there is not a lot of training in eating disorders in school, maybe none for some people, depending on which internship you go to or which um, specific rotations you have. So someone who's hiring knows that they are going to have to train you on the job. What they really want is passion and interest. Everything is a skill that can be taught except for caring about this population. If you're the kind of person that just loves numbers and TPN calculations, then probably the eating disorder field isn't for you. But if this is an area you have a passion about because you had an eating disorder and you're in a good recovery or someone you know had an eating disorder and got help from a dietitian or you know whatever the case may be, that passion carries you a long way. And so having attended eating disorder conferences, having taken eating disorders boot camp as a student, those are things that will look good to an employer that, okay, this person has the raw material. I can do the training, the on the job, how to do your job, um, the supervision. But what I need is the person with the heart for this, not the person who's just looking for a job and they would take anything. Um, this is not the field to go into if you would just take any job. So you're interested, definitely eating disorders boot camp is the way to go. And I will look forward to talking with you when you do your call with me. Okay. I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling. Another question in a recent... Oh, Kate, hello. I said I was gonna say hello to everyone, so I didn't say individual hellos, but I did. Okay, on a recent call with other San Diego RDs, one asked, how do we learn how to be good at managing, uh-oh, uh-oh, okay, the tech, it's the tech, I hang on, with other San Diego RDs, how do we learn how to be good at managing and assisting a client with a complex case and needs a team leader if the therapist or parent is not stepping up or capable of doing so, so not just nutrition. Okay, so we're talking about a client who 
we're trying to do the nutrition work with a client who doesn't have a strong leader of the team, therapist or parent. Okay, so that's really a challenge. And um, I'm trying to think what would be, you know, because you're not talking about necessarily, um, you know, uh, case management as far as the, um, as far as the insurance part. So you can get a case manager from the insurance company, but that may or may not actually be what you're talking about here. So this is more like on the ground. I'm trying to do nutrition counseling and this person doesn't have a stable support system that's able to help them. Okay, so it's there was a parent mentioned. So I'm not sure if this might be, you know, a minor because if someone is a minor, of course, then, you know, someone is responsible for their medical care. And so if a parent isn't able to, the question then becomes, do they need a legal guardian, something like that? And that's something to talk with the pediatrician about because usually it's going to be the pediatrician who sort of has the leverage, let's call it, to, let's say, involve child services, which I hope is not the issue, um, or, you know, kind of um, be forceful, let's say, with a parent and saying, you know, at least one of these caregivers needs to step up, otherwise child services is going to have to get involved. You know, that kind of thing is such a negative. I really hate to ever see it get to that level, but if it's at that level, then there that may be something that needs to happen. Um, okay, let's see what else. Um, as far as the therapist not being, you know, not stepping up and being the lead, therapists are really trained to be individualized and, not individualized, sorry, confidential and not work on a team. And so they may not be, into care coordination at all. And part of a dietitian's job is care coordination in the sense of coordinating with the nutrition aspect. And sometimes we get sort of looped or roped into um, care coordination in a bigger level because we're good at it, but it's not necessarily our job and we're not getting paid for it. So there may be sort of a line item that a dietitian needs to start charging for, which is care coordination. And um, it may not be reimbursable by insurance, but it may just need to be um, you know, an additional bill charge. Um, if they're spending a lot of time on the phone, let's say with other providers, um, I think you should charge enough that sort of those routine calls with other providers are included in your fee. But if there's non-routine calls, if um, there's sort of coaching, you know, in between sessions and things that's having to happen, then that may be um, something that needs to be billed separately. There's also recovery coaches, right? So recovery coaches can be sort of a... Um, what would you call it? Maybe a paraprofessional. I don't know quite what the right word is, but someone who can be more available than a dietitian who someone is meeting with once or twice a week and can be the, the coordinator uh, between all of the parties. So again, getting someone else involved, that's not necessarily the dietitian's job to do, but someone whose specific job is more that care coordination. There are meal support services, which sometimes provide some of that care coordination as well. Um, I'm not sure I'm answering the question because I don't know if I have it if I have the details right, um, or if I'm uh, conceptualizing it right. So Kate, you're welcome to um, to add more if there is more and I'm not quite getting the question right. But the bottom line is that we have to, um, we really have to look at what is our role as a dietitian and what is the client and their support system bringing to the table and how can we get their support system stronger so that we can go back to being just the dietitian and it's it's a challenge it's a real challenge because what we're working with within is a system a culture that does not recognize eating disorders as the severity that they are and so we sometimes feel like the person saying the emperor has no clothes because we are the person saying this is a big problem and everyone needs to step up or this is not going to improve and it's hard it's really hard to be that person um there is always the possibility and i'm just going to throw this out there because i feel like you know we should mention all possibilities that the dietitian just needs to let go and say you know what i only have my role that i can control my sphere of influence and you know, I can't, I, I can't make this work. Um, and maybe even say that out loud and say, you know, this isn't a safe situation for me as the dietitian. Nutrition counseling is still indicated, but needs to take place in a setting where care coordination can be more part of the structure. So that might be an IOP or more likely a day treatment program or something like that. And the dietitian can simply say, you know, if you look at the APA criteria, supportive um, home environment is one of the criteria for outpatient care. And if the person simply doesn't have that, then it may make sense for the dietitian to say, you know, 
you know, you can't make someone go to a higher level of care, but you can say, you know, you no longer meet criteria for outpatient care, you're no longer a candidate for this practice, or until um, there's more support, you know, uh, sort of gathered or in the home or the situation, then I, I need to not schedule additional appointments because it seems like we're spinning our wheels a bit. It's also possible, you know, that more visits with the therapist would be helpful, but it doesn't sound like it. And then the last thing I'll say is it's, always okay even though we don't like to do it and it should be something that we kind of save um, for when it's really needed to say something like do you think you're getting what you need from your therapist um, is it time for maybe a new um, a new perspective on this situation and sometimes you know that's just a conversation we can open with the client um, Karina thank you for uh, I love this dialogue this could be used for so many scenarios heart heart love it okay build up dietitians hello thank you so much for encouraging me to do this what made you want to become a dietitian and what made you want to get into the eating disorder space um, let's see what made me want to become a dietitian is hilarious um, it was literally I took nutrition as an elective because one of my friends said it was an easy A. I was an anthropology major and didn't know how I was going to make anthropology into a career, but once I took that nutrition class as an elective and loved it so much, I decided to do essentially a double major. was not exactly how it turned out, but between anthropology and nutrition. And so when I was doing that, I decided to get a master's in sports nutrition, and as I kind of went along with my research and studies and all of that, what became clear was that the, the aspects of anthropology that I love, the cultural aspects, the psychology of eating, the, the environment, why you chose the things you chose, how they got to you in the first place, long before they ever impacted your actual digestion and absorption and metabolism and nutrition. All of that, even though I feel like there's a little bit of that kind of recognition that that belongs in every area of dietetics, and should have even from the beginning, but really 25 years ago, the only place that kind of thing was being discussed was in the eating disorder field. So eating disorders was really the area that was most fascinating to me because we were talking about those things. How did food get to you in the first place? There was sort of an activism aspect to it. And so eating disorders became the area I decided to specialize in. And I, I it was obviously the right choice for me. It was a really good fit um, and I feel like you know, sadly, the field of dietetics has not advanced enough in those 25 years to really recognize that, you know, eating disorders and dysfunctional eating behaviors are not rare, like, you know, we were sort of taught in school, and there's just so much more to it. But that is what has fueled my career for 25 years. And that's why I say it was the right choice for me, because those aspects of eating disorders that sort of connect with that anthropology mindset that I have uh, was really perfect. I also got a message from um, Build Up Dietitians to be sure to say my social channels. So let's see, Facebook is Jessica Setnick, Twitter, Jessica Setnick, LinkedIn, Jessica Setnick. Um, the outlier is Instagram, which is understanding nutrition. So please feel free to follow me in those places. And you're also welcome to message me on Facebook. And as I said in my post, I will be, um, taking note of anyone who asks questions in the first five minutes and I will be um, I will be direct messaging you to find out if you where to send your uh, eating disorders pocket guide or if you prefer $40 off eating disorders boot camp I will send you that code I just got a message from Marsha saying thank totally agree about the boot camp it helped me so much thanks Marsha um, Angela says, perfect, thank you. I know there's not a lot regarding eating disorders in my graduate program, that's for sure. Most programs, that's true, it's unfortunate, but that is exactly what Eating Disorders Bootcamp is supposed to solve. And Build Up Dietitian says, you're coming to the end of your Facebook Live. Thank you so much, Jessica, for taking the time. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe we're already at the end. Um, I, I'm so amazed that this actually worked and how people can reach me with my, in, with your individual questions. Absolutely. Please, um, direct message me. I would welcome that. And let's see a follow-up from Kate. This is helpful. I think it's especially hard for an RD in this situation who has not worked in a treatment team. Oh yeah. To have confidence in the roles of the team member. I totally agree with that. Oh, I've got another question. Build up dietitians. Is it okay if I keep going? Um, Anthony says, I'm an upcoming college student who randomly, oh shoot, who randomly, yikes, 
stepped in this group page. Oh my gosh, Jessica's talk about this part of nutrition and dietetics strengthens my resolve to take up this course. I love this talk so much. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh, you made my day. Thank you. Oh, amazing. Thank you, Anthony. Okay, everyone, time to go. Mwah. Thank you for being part of this. At 49, there's not that many firsts, and this one went really well. So I really am so glad you all were here. And anyone watching the recording, thanks to you too. Bye for now.